So the next pattern we're going to talk about is called template method. And this is a very, very, very common pattern. It's kind of up there with factory method and iterator and strategy and so on, as far as some of the most commonly applied patterns in the Gang of Four book in practice. So of course, we'll start out by explaining how we can use template method in the context of our expression tree processing app. And uh, the way we're going to use it is we're going to factor out common code in order to support multiple operating modes, basically the succinct mode versus verbose mode we've been talking about uh, on and off in these various discussions. And I thought this might actually be a good time to, to see if I can run the program and actually show you what all this stuff does. I probably should have done this a long time ago. Uh, so let's go ahead and bring up the expression tree. Whoops, come on. All right, give me a second. What a pain. The, um, for some reason that I still am not entirely clear about, if I switch back and forth between my, uh, Windows machine and my Mac, it gets confused when it's trying to build the program, which is really annoying. But uh, let them, they'll just take a second to clean up. So let's delete it. There we go. All right, now let's try to open it up again. Okay. All right. Maybe we we may or may not actually uh, run this today. Hold on. What is going? Oh, goodness. Naturally, it decides to stop working when I need it to work. Size up. Hmm. Oh, well. Um, that is really bizarre. Well, I'll tell you what I'll do. Uh, rather than waste time on this right now, I will go back after class, get the program to work, and then I'll show you how it works uh, in the video that I put out. That's really bizarre. It was uh, compiling just fine on my other machine. All right, let's go back here. So the, the purpose of this example is to demonstrate how to factor out common code to support multiple operating modes, succinct mode and verbose mode. So what you'll see here is that template method will allow controlled variability for the steps in an algorithm. And we'll see how that plays out here in just a minute. The expression tree app has two primary operating modes, verbose mode and succinct mode. And verbose mode, as you can see, is where you type in commands using the command pattern in order to process those commands. And then succinct mode uses macro command to bundle everything up so you have a very simple command line calculator interface where you can type in expressions in infix or in order and have it processed to produce results. Now, whenever you start doing a program that has, you know, sort of multiple ways of doing more or less the same thing, you have to be very careful because if you're not careful, you can end up with what's called the, the problem of repeating yourself and having multiple versions of things. Uh, in particular, you don't want to make the program structured around the algorithm because then you have all the problems we've got with 
algorithmic decomposition where small changes break stuff and ripple through the program. But instead, you really want to put the complexity and the organizational part of the software in the structure itself, which, of course, should be based on classes and objects. And whenever you start trying to do things where you've got multiple versions that are more or less the same, you can end up with something called siloing. And if you're not careful, you'll have one base line of code that handles verbose mode, another base line of code that handles succinct mode, and never the twain shall meet. And why that's a problem is you're going to end up repeating yourself. And so if there's bug fixes or improvements, optimizations you want to add, you're going to have to go and do this in multiple places. And that becomes very tedious and error prone. And it also violates one of the key principles of uh, good design, which is the don't repeat yourself principle. I think that might be the, the D in uh, solid. <laughs> so uh, don't repeat yourself or dry says, Rather than repeat yourself, instead factor the code out using various patterns, using various classes, and so on, and then parameterize and instantiate and customize in order to get the variability that you need. So it's, it's also kind of along the same lines as the scope, commonality, variability stuff we've been talking about. So how are we going to do that in this case? We're going to implement the key algorithm in our program once in a superclass or in a base class. And this is the way it's going to work. We're going to have a class called ET for expression tree event handler. And it's going to have a method called handle input. And here's what the handle input method looks like. And we're going to call this thing a template method. And you'll see why we call it a template method. Uh, it's not because it uses C++ STL templates, which uh, actually really hardly even existed at the time when the Gang of Four was first writing this pattern. Instead, you should think of it more like the word boilerplate. So a template or a boilerplate um, is something that, that kind of is a cookie cutter stamp, and it always has the same form. But then in this particular case, we can parameterize it in clever ways. And you'll see how that works. But, but when you hear the word template method, don't think parameterize type in C++. This is actually not related to that at all, <laughs> for the most part. Um, the other methods we have here, as you can see, prompt user, receive input, make command, execute command. Those are called hook methods or primitive operations. The Gang of Four book uses the word primitive operation. I like the word hook method better. It's, it's a more modern way of saying the same kind of thing. So the way to look at this is a template method is implemented once, and it's implemented using calls to a bunch of hook methods. And why this is significant is that then you can come along and subclass from the base class and then override the various hook methods, thereby allowing controlled variability in the behavior or the steps that the template method performs. So you can see here, depending on what mode we're in, whether we're in verbose mode or succinct mode and so on, prompt user and make command will vary in their implementation, in their behavior, but the overall structure of the template method will remain unchanged. And that's very nice because now we're not repeating ourselves. We're keeping the code common, but we're able to systematically vary the implementation. And that's really at the heart of what template method is all about. So let's take a look at an example here, for instance, is the make command method for verbose mode ET event handler. And in this particular case, it's just calling down to the make command method that's part of the command factory. We had talked about this when we talked about the command pattern and the, the factory method pattern and so on. So we've already looked at these before in previous lessons. Here is the make command hook method for succinct mode. So this is the one for verbose mode. Here's the one for succinct mode. Now at first glance, they look kind of the same, but they actually differ and they differ in an important way. You can see that for the succinct mode version, we prepend the keyword macro space in front of the actual user input. And that's a trigger that tells the underlying factory method, make command, which is a factory method, in order to make us a macro command as opposed to making us a regular command. And so as a result, that's going to be more, uh, well, it's going to work for succinct mode because it's going to bundle together 
the processing of using the format command to be the in order format command, making the expr command be the input that's provided here, and then bundling up an eval command with post order traversal processing. So all those things are kind of put together in the macro command. If you go back and watch the command pattern video, you'll see how macro commands are defined. And that's how we implement succinct mode. We actually have three commands or subcommands bundled together into a so-called macro command. And so that's how we're going to selectively vary the behavior. And you'll notice that nothing else changes. So handle input stays the same. It prompts the user, it receives the input, it makes the command, it executes the command. But then we selectively modify bits and pieces of stuff that needs to change. So what's the, the key point of this? We end up with much better support for systematic reuse. So our code now has one algorithm, but we can customize it to support the different modes. So we're completely living within the, the constraints or the guidelines of the don't repeat yourself principle, which, which is very important. So what does the ET event handler class look like? So it's basically an abstract class or a, an abstract base class that provides the boilerplate algorithm for controlling the operating modes in our expression tree processing app. And as you can see, it's got the template method called handle input, which gets dispatched when, when input shows up from the user. We have these four hook methods, prompt the user, receive the input, make the command, execute the command. And we then have the make handler method, which is a factory method that either makes a succinct mode ET event handler or a verbose mode ET event handler. So I think it should be pretty clear from a commonality and variability perspective why these things work so nicely. We have this common interface that is going to uh, factor out the steps in the template method. So everything is always fixed. We have a fixed algorithm we could actually make handle input be a, a non-virtual method if we wanted to. We, we make it virtual just to be on the safe side if we need to change the steps. But if we never change the steps, handle input could actually be non-virtual. And we would get variability, which is shown down below, by subclassing the ET event handler class to be succinct or verbose and so on. So this is kind of what we end up with when we're all said and done. We've got this abstract base class. We've got these subclasses or derived classes. and they it thereby enhance the reuse of the structure because we've got a common structure. And of course, some of the functionality, the functionality that's defined in the template method, the functionality in the methods that are not changing, like for, for example, execute command or receive input, those things stay the same. And then we could also, you know, potentially even provide default implementations of prompt user and make command and then only have to change them if we need to do something different. I didn't choose to do that in this case, but I could have. 